Backyard Farmer is a co-production of NET Television and the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension. Tonight on Backyard Farmer, we'll update you on Zach's prairie grass and we'll show you some beautiful hydrangeas. That's all coming up next, right here on Backyard Farmer. Welcome to another hour of Good Gardening on Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we've got our panel of experts from the University of Nebraska Extension ready to answer your questions. Insects tonight go to Wayne Onasor. Good evening, Kim. We have Weeds and Turf, Rock Bissawa. Super duper to be here, Kim. <laughs> Amy Timmerman, Rots and Spots. Hi, Kim. And Elizabeth Killinger, all the horticulture and landscape questions. Hi, Kim. You know, you can get your gardening questions answered by dialing 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. If you have pictures, you can email us at byf at unl.edu. We do answer those on a future show, and if you send us one, please tell us as much information as you can, including where you live. You can also follow us on our Facebook fan page and on Twitter. Do keep in mind that we can't get to everybody's question on the air, so if you really do need further assistance, you can always go to the Backyard Farmer website, or you can stop by your local Extension office for more information. Before we get to questions, we have samples, and that is really timely because we had a picture come in today that was too late to load. Well, I'm glad this one is timely. This is a cucumber that looks a little rough. Uh, right now, we got a lot of cucumbers in the garden that are getting ready, and a lot of people want to be slicing them or pickling them. And this one just looks rough on the outside. This is from cucumber beetles chewing on the fruit. Uh, it's cosmetic damage on the outside, so you can definitely peel this away and still pickle or eat them as you see fit. So I'm not or you can slice them like that and see if your guests yeah. figure out that it's not supposed to be that way. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how thin you slice them. There you go. And if you, if you really feel the need to, to control this, something uh, like uh, permethrin, uh, and then make sure you follow the pre-harvest interval on there to All make right. sure you don't serve your guests too much insecticide. All right, thank you, Wayne. All right, Rock, speaking of cool things and interesting things and prairie-like things. I've got, hopefully, Dan, I didn't mess that up for you, sorry. This is uh, <coughs> side oats grandma. It's one of the warm season grasses. I uh, love this one. I have several of these in my yard and they are there are some cultivated varieties, but generally it's just a really nice prairie grass, warm season, so it's heading and looking really good in the sun. Side oats from the name, the seed head sticks off from the side rather than coming up in a more panical arrangement. It's actually a spike, uh, modified spike, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And so it's a uh, member of the Budalua genus, um, and I incorrectly said gracilis earlier. What is it? Curtipendula. Curtipendula. You got a <laughs> pendula. I, I love that name. So anyway, it's a great warm season grass. Great for the uh, uh, prairie uh, settings in and in, inside of the city or outside of the city. It's great out on these acreages, and it's beautiful out in uh, western Nebraska. Beautiful, drought hardy, um, pretty warm season grass. Native. Excellent and fun to strip the seeds. I thought about doing that, but they would fly all over and then. They would be You'd places we speak. don't want them to be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amy. We actually, uh, oh no, you have iris, right? I have you iris have the today. Corn thing. Okay. Yep, I went with All the right. irises today. Um, found these in the UNL iris bed. Um, this is iris leaf spot. It's a common fungal disease that we typically see. Uh, the big thing with it is usually this time of year we're cutting back our irises because they're done blooming. Um, but it will usually develop right as the irises are starting to bloom. And it started off with, if Danny, if you can see that, it starts off with these little water-soaked lesions right here, a little bit yellow in coloration. And as they gradually progress, and they're going to become into these bigger lesions. So you see that that's the smaller lesion, and then they gradually progress into these. And as the lesions get worse, you're going to see this upper leaf here. We just end up with death of the entire leaf. Um, typically, I don't recommend a lot of management with this one, no fungicide applications. Um, however, this is one that you do want to get removed from the landscape. You want to cut it back because it overwinters in that debris. And these right here, if you took a really, really close look, I'm able to see they're starting to sporulate already. So cut off your irises. 
You can throw them in the compost pile as long as your compost is getting to the correct heat. You will kill all those spores and then you can use it back onto your beds next year. If you're not composting and it's not the correct heat, you're not getting enough heat, just throw it in the trash. It's probably the best solution to the whole thing. And then um, next spring, just make sure no overhead irrigation. Um, soaker hoses will all help with iris leaf spot. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. And in keeping with our Oh Beautiful theme this year, Elizabeth, you have a bundle. I have a bundle and I love fall. And so some of the things that come around with fall are some of these grasses like the um, side oats grandma, but we have switchgrass, Indian grass, big blue stem, um, some of the penicetums. And then here is your blue grandma rock that you were Thank talking you. about earlier with the little flags on it. Um, and so those are some of the ones that we're seeing right now that are just going to be in their full glory before too long. And then some of the perennials. Um, we have the Illinois bundle flower, which has a really unique um, seed pod on there. And then we've got, of course, the sedums and the seed heads. And so this is just a good reminder to think about the landscape as multiple seasons of interest. Not just think about the pretty flowers that are in bloom, but these grasses can stand tall all winter long and then cut them back next spring, let them add some winter interest. Um, and then it's always fun to see the different forms out in the landscape too. So um, think about that, multiple seasons of interest, some different forms out there, and then let the, let the fall bloomers and, and the fall lovers really take off right now. Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right. First pick goes to you, Wayne. Uh, this is uh, Wayne County, so it seems pretty appropriate. There you go. And that would be uh, a viewer found what she's saying are eggs. Okay. But, uh, and on milkweed, and then wondering if they're the eggs of good guys or bad guys. Well, unfortunately, they're not eggs. Mm -hmm. Rather, they are um, oleander aphids. And these things will get onto milkweeds of all kinds, as well as some of the dog beans and other, uh, in that Asclepiaceidae, whatever, <laughs> as I stare at Elizabeth here to help me out with that. Uh, they get onto the plants in those families, and they, uh, they can be quite unsightly. They can even cause some top dieback if they get to be too big of a population. They're an invasive aphid. They're actually from Eurasia. Insecticidal soaps, washing off with strong jets of water, um, anything like that will work. And if you really want to go something a little more heavy, you can use like a permethrin type. Uh, stay away from carbaryl. It doesn't work very well with insects that have sucking mouth parts. Excellent. Thank you, Wayne. Use that water first. Mm -hmm. All right. Rock, you have uh, a viewer that, uh, let's see, we're not knowing where they're from, but they have that, that strip between sidewalk and curb. And he's saying that the weedy areas in that uh, spot have just gone nuts. He wants to know what he should use to kill them. Oh, it, it's Western Omaha, I'm sorry. And will pulling do any good? Okay, so there's a little bit of crabgrass action going on in there, and there's uh, definitely some spurge going on. And you'll notice these are right next to the sidewalk or to the driveway, the curb, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, I think, Kim, the first time I heard this term used with you, but we call them hell strips, mm -hmm. and they are hard to grow things. And the turf there, just naturally, that's corner, so it's probably got a fair amount of traffic, uh, high heat load, much more than the, in the interior when the turf uh, uh, transpires, it cools it off, but it, the, the, the boundary layer is lower because the stand is reduced, so there's all kinds of problems there. Um, you know, pulling them will obviously work. They're annuals. Uh, they're seeding now. The crabgrass, so if it's mowed, doesn't seed as prolifically, but the spurge is seeding, getting ready to pop seed. So you can pull them all you want. It's just kind of a lesson in futility at this point in time. Uh, spraying them makes absolutely no sense. So physically, uh, uh, just you know, mow them off and hope that you can get some of the seed picked up when you do that. And then the bottom line is, is then uh, turn around and worry about them next year. Both those weeds are readily controlled with a pre-emergent herbicide containing either pendimethalin or prodiamine or dithiopyr. So fall excuse me, spring applications uh, per your crabgrass recommendations, you'll get the crabgrass, you'll get the spurge. You also pick up a virtual wealth of other weeds in that uh, in that class. So. That relatively easy to control. Uh, Kim, I just want to make a correction for last week. Lowell um, inadvertently said that we don't recommend Bella bluegrass, and we do recommend it in certain niches. It's extremely shade tolerant, and we have sites where it's done extremely well. It is one that we produced out of the University of Nebraska, vegetatively propagated bluegrass. But it's fairly specialized, and it has a little bit of a price tag to it, but it's really unique. I have it in my backyard between um, pavers and it looks really good in there in a very heavily painted, paved, 
paved area next to the pond. So that was a little incorrect on his part. We we recommend it, but we want to have a conversation with you or have a conversation with the people that's, that market it for us, Todd Valley Farms, to make sure you're putting it in the right place. It failed in, in, in the one location we had it in, but that was one location, and it's done quite well in a number of other locations. All right. Thanks, Rock. Uh, Amy, we had actually three people send us images of these same shrooms. Mm -hmm. And one of them that I don't think we sent actually had them cut open. Okay. So what is this one? And how do you control it, if, if at all? Well, since it's been cut open, um, it really, to me, looks like a puffball uh, type mushroom. Uh, these are decomposers. Uh, these are the type of fungi. Uh, Oh, there's the, another image of it. This is a different uh, fungus. This is not a puffball. But all these are decomposers. So they're breaking down all that organic matter in the soil. Um, in a turf situation, you're probably looking at that thatch layer. Uh, I would always suggest looking to make sure your thatch isn't too deep because we might be getting too much uh, thatch. And then those type of fungi are going to be a little very prolific. Um, any old tree roots, they're feeding and decaying those tree roots. So these are just the fruiting structures of those fungi. There isn't a lot I really recommend for management. Uh, there's nothing you can spray in your yard. They're going to continue to grow. Uh, the best thing is you can take the mower across them or just go out and physically remove them uh, from the landscape. Within a couple of days, they will just disintegrate on their own. And uh, the one nice thing is... With their conversion of all that organic matter, you're getting some great nitrogen for your plants. And so it, it's, it's a natural nitrogen source for you. All right. Thank you, Amy. Elizabeth, this is a viewer in Union who has a, kind of a, a, a tree issue, a beautiful 100-year-old oak and then an interloper, and is wondering, uh, he knows he can cut it out, but then he... He's, he doesn't want to rogue the roots out, and but he's wondering, can he treat the stump with any kind of a, a, a product? And he's mentioned Gordon RDU as a possibility. He might have meant Tordon. Okay. Um, yes, you can cut that tree out. The thing is, is if you treat that stump with a product like Tordon that contains picloram, it can move root to root. And if you have that root to root, those roots touching, you're going to kill the, the tree that you want to keep. There are some other products on the market. I believe one of them is called Crossbow. It's not supposed to move root to root quite as much, um, but you're going to have to read and follow those label instructions and then look at your active ingredients if you do decide that you want to do a treatment. More than likely, you're probably going to have to treat that stump just to make sure that you get a good kill on that one that you don't want. Um, but, you know, I'd probably look at um, that root to root issue and then maybe steer clear of, of some of those products. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, we promised to show you a feature on hardscape material, but that's gonna wait until next week because our turf grass specialist, Zach Riker, did some things this spring, seeding his front lawn with buffalo grass and a stand of mixed prairie grasses. So for our first feature tonight, we're going to return to his place and see how those grasses have established themselves. Just wrapping up mowing on, on my buffalo grass lawn. This was about the 10th uh, mowing or so on this lawn. Seeded it back in May, and it's about the first week of August. And it's come along quite nicely. Uh, most of us uh, think that buffalo grass is low maintenance, and it is fairly low maintenance after the first year of establishment. The first year we have to keep it watered, we have to mow it. Like I said, it's been about 10 mowings on this, uh, and keep it regularly fertilized. I've applied three or four applications of fertilizer and uh, uh, be pretty aggressive with the weed control. This particular site of mine has lots of foxtail, goose grass, uh, little love grass, has everything under the sun, and so I had to be pretty aggressive with the, with the weeds, otherwise they'll outcompete the relatively slow growing buffalo grass. And once we have it grown in, which it's, it's almost, almost fully grown in, still has about another month to grow in, and it will move in uh, with stolons. It's forming pretty aggressive stolons right now and has another month or so to, 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 to grow in, it'll be relatively low maintenance. Uh, normally we'll get about one, maybe two applications of fertilizer, about a pound of nitrogen in June and July. Uh, mowing is, is a little bit more relaxed. I'll probably mow uh, once every three to four weeks at three inches. And the nice thing about buffalo grass, it's so slow growing that if you happen to miss a mowing or don't have quite the schedule, you can go a couple more days without much of a problem. 
And then the most, one of the most important things you can do with buffalo grass is uh, weed control in the fall. Once it's gone dormant, October, November, I like Thanksgiving, uh, apply it, apply Roundup over the top of that. It will control the vast majority of weeds. Uh, also, a, maybe a broadleaf weed application will also work uh, to help that, that buffalo grass. Since it is slow growing, it's not very competitive with weeds. So we do have to use a little bit of weed control to keep buffalo grass as good looking as it can be. This is the native grasses I established about the same week, about almost the same time that I did the buffalo grass, so it's uh, about the first week of May. And uh, these have come in very nicely. We've had a great summer with plenty of uh, water, plenty of rain, and just like the buffalo grass, it's important to uh, spend a little time in, in keeping this mode, uh, to keep down most of the weeds, uh, keeping it watered if you can. You can't always do that, but keeping it watered. Applying, you know, a fairly frequent fertilizer. I applied uh, fertilizer two or three times this summer on this. And then the other thing I used on this was fairly frequent herbicides because, again, this site is just loaded with, with lots of different weeds. You can see a couple of them in here. And if I don't aggressively mow it, as well as apply herbicides to control the weeds, then they will tend to dominate the warm season grasses. And uh, a little bit of weeds uh, are, are certainly tolerable, but by the frequent mowing, I mowed this area about three or four times, and it really cuts down on the amount of weed pressure that you have. This is a low maintenance area. It'll receive a mowing about once a year, Roundup in the fall, and maybe a broadleaf herbicide in the fall. It'll be a really low maintenance site for this, for this property. As Zach said, that first year of establishment is when most of the hard work has to be done to keep those weeds down. And the benefits of lower management and lower water requirements come after the prairie grasses and the buffalo grass have properly established themselves. And I think that's the reason people give up on it. It just, they just don't do it right to begin well, they with. They expect Instagrass and they expect it to establish as right. quick. And you're exactly right, Kim. It's, it's, yeah. it, you gotta be patient, but you don't have to be that patient. The, the new cultivars establish quickly and yeah. yeah, you're exactly right. There we go. All right, uh, establishing quickly, we have <laughs> these little guys on a blue spruce and carny. Wayne, in this next picture, they were gone for a couple weeks and then they got this. And uh, they oh, want to yes. know, they have lots of other trees around and I know we've gotten lots of questions. So what do we do now this time of year with bagworms? Bagworms this time of year? Yeah, I almost go around and pick them off. If, mm -hmm. if they are no longer physically moving around on that plant, they're no longer feeding and they're enclosed in that bag and you cannot get to them with an insecticide. So your only recourse is to either remove the bagworms or remove the tree. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave that up to the uh, homeowner to decide which one they'd rather do. <laughs> Elizabeth um, disagrees with that last oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, it is kind of late in the yeah. season. Hopefully it'll end up like one house I went to where the one 15-foot arborvitae got completely stripped mm -hmm. and then the other one on the other side of the porch was fine, but they were moving towards that one. Of course they were, they were hungry. All right, uh, Rock, this is a Northeast Nebraska viewer with sandy soil, has weeds showing up all over the yard. They, apparently they've tried all sorts of chemicals, 2,4-D, Trimac, uh, and it's this particular weed is the one that they sent pictures of. Uh, this yellow wood sorrel or oxalis, it's a very unique weed in that you tend to see it in a small part of your yard or your lawn. I mean, it can grow pretty much anywhere. And then because it has the capacity to projectile, or shoot the seed because it has a little trigger mechanism in it up to five, six feet, continues to do that. And before, you know, where you had like a little five foot circle of it and all of a sudden, you know, now you have 15 and then 50. So you want to get on it with something. Um, it, it doesn't react very well to pre-emergent herbicides um, depending upon which taxonomist you talk to. It's either a short-lived perennial or an annual. I tend to think in Nebraska it behaves like a perennial. Um, it will, you know, burn back with a 2,4-D type product. I still think we're a little early in the season for fall applications and uh, um, I would catch it, you know, sometime after Labor Day when the uh, deciduous trees are starting to lose their leaves and not moving that herbicide back into it and the vines and the tomatoes are, are pretty much not ex importing, they're exporting so that we're not going to see any damage or less damage at that point in time and if they get damaged it'll be less. So bottom line is it's going to take a herbicide application. Fall applications will work because I think it tends to perform like a perennial here um, and uh, and then if you see them next spring, early spring, because they do germinate early, go ahead and spray them but long before the trees start to leaf out. We certainly don't want to damage the uh, deciduous trees and shrubs. Thank you, sir. 
All right, Amy, this is a Cass County viewer, uh, Autumn Blaze Maple. About half the tree has foliage that is turning black like this and falling off. It's been happening for about a week. We've had two or three other people ask about um, anthracnose, tar spot, odd things going on in maples right now. There's been some anthracnose going around, but this picture doesn't lead me toward anthracnose, so it's the way it's burning back. It's really burning from the tips, working its way back. It um, looks very much similar to like a sun scorch, and typically we see that with a lot really warm weathers and dry conditions like we saw in 12 and 13, and we haven't been having those experiences here lately. We've been cooler weather, um, wonderful rains coming around. So I guess my one question would be, what is the base of the tree looking like? Are we looking at any root issues, planting depth issues, girdling of roots as a whole? Um, seeing that much scorching in the weather hasn't been conducive for it. Um, so just take a look at the overall health of the tree and it may be a time that we need to make some long-term decisions on that tree. Because if it's a girdled root or some major root issues, what is the longevity of the tree? And that's hard to predict. Um, it can survive for several years, but it's not going to be that nice full tree that you're looking for and it's going to slowly decline. So um, just go out and do some assessments in your landscape. And, and as you progress with those questions, just let somebody know and we're always happy to answer those. All right, excellent. And if they need to bring a sample in, they can do that to yes. the diagnostic clinic. All right, thanks. You have a tree question too, Elizabeth. Uh, this is a viewer who has a honey locust that is uh, doing its usual thing, which is sprouting all over the turf. And they did remove some sections of large roots facing the house, which of course usually makes it sprout more. Uh, and it, that is exactly what it's doing. They wanna know what their options are, one of them being cut down the tree. That might be a little drastic um, to cut down the tree. You know, we like large trees because they provide shade. Um, you know, one thing that you do not want to do is you do not want to spray those suckers with a glyphosate-like product. Because um, what that will do is it'll take that up into the system of the big tree. Um, that works if your goal is to kill the big tree. Um, but with those suckers where they're located in the lawn, just continue to mow them. Um, you can mow them off in those landscape bed areas. You can continue to um, try to pull them out, try to plug them out. You, you know, you might be able to, to get by with a, I doubt a selective herbicide in that location, but you want to try to get them out of there so they don't take over um, and start to grow. So in the lawn, just continue to mow them. Um, try not to stress the tree out too much where it starts to make more, more suckers and water sprouts. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. I have a honey locust, I feel his pain. <laughs> well, harvest time is right around the corner for some of our melons in the garden. For our green and growing tip this week, Sarah Browning helps us figure out when it's time to pick that watermelon. Watermelon is a summertime treat, and if you have enough space, it's fun to grow in the home garden too. But how do you know when your watermelon is ready to be harvested? Well, the first thing you want to do is check your seed packet and see what the number of days is from seeding to harvest. Most modern cultivars will, will uh, have fruits in somewhere between 75 to 85 days. Heirloom cultivars will be a little bit longer, usually 90 to 100 days. So that will give you an idea of when your fruits should be reaching maturity. Uh, another thing you can check is the white spot where the fruit has laid on the ground. When the fruit is immature, the, white, the, the base of the watermelon will be white, but as it nears maturity, that base spot will turn to a creamy yellow color. And finally, give it a thump. A ripe watermelon should sound hollow when you thump it with your finger. So all those things together should help you figure out when your watermelons are ready to be eaten. We probably have a week or so to go before some of those watermelons are ripe and ready to pick, and hopefully these tips are going to help you figure out when you can pick yours. We had the little one called Fairy out there, which is an All-America selection. Apparently it cracks itself open when it's ready, which of course means that the people harvesting just eat it right there in the field. <laughs> okay, let's see. Wayne, this is an Ashland viewer who wants to know about the eggs of monarch butterflies. Are the caterpillars laying those eggs yet? And if so, what color are they? <laughs> well, the uh, 
caterpillars will not be laying the eggs. The adult butterflies will mm -hmm. be. Um, at this point, uh, yeah, we should be seeing a few of those eggs around. Uh, they will be kind of a white color with uh, some light, light green lines on them and some small white looking greenish dots uh, in between those lines. Uh, and then hopefully we'll see some caterpillars before too long. Uh, the fun part about them is they, uh, they actually will start by eating a circle out of the leaf or an uh, area to drain the sap out and then they'll start feeding before they can get going. So if they're seeing orange ones, those are aphids, not eggs. Correct. There we go. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a Norfolk viewer, Rock, that is saying they have black medic mm -hmm. and is wondering how they control it. Yeah, black medic is an annual uh, legume. Um, actually, we've done some revegetation work with it. It's a very prolific um, annual legume. It's relatively easy to control uh, with uh, applications of herbicide in the spring, but now it's pretty much on its downhill slide into fall. Since it is an annual next uh, fall, when you put down your standard pre-emergent herbicides for uh, crabgrass control, you should uh, knock the black medic seedlings back as well. So it's really not much you can do now. I would not be starting to spray these because they're gonna die with that first frost anyway. Excellent. Thank you, Rock. Amy, uh, we had a viewer who watched last week, mm -hmm. and we had uh, Hawthorne okay. Rust on last week, and they, they want to know how to control it and with what. Hawthorne Rust, you're going to start with any major fruit tree or tree spray program. Um, you start out at um, leaf emergence, leaf bud, and then depending on the weather, it's either going to be two or three applications. And it also depends on the product that you're using. You're going to have to read the label very closely, whether it's a 14-day spray interval, 21 or 28 days. Uh, there are several different products available on the market. Um, I would advise that you go to the INR pubs. We have a NEB guide on cedar apple, cedar on uh, cedar hawthorn rust, and we have a full list of all those fungicides that are that you can spray on ornamental apple, edible apple, and then those other deciduous trees in your landscape. Because you do have to be really careful if any viewers are looking at spraying edible apples. There are definitely different fungicides you can use on edible apples versus ornamental apples and hawthorns. And so you need to be really careful. So I would advise that you go there and then you go to your local garden store and then you start reading labels um, to determine which product's gonna work the best for you and how long it's gonna last. Excellent, thank you, Amy. Elizabeth, this is a viewer who planted a new red oak this spring. They're wondering whether they should wrap the trunk this winter, and is there any particular special care to get it into the winter healthy? Into the winter healthy. The main thing is to make sure that it has adequate moisture up until it starts to drop its leaves. We don't want to give it too much moisture, otherwise it won't harden off properly. And when we wrap the trunk, we want to make sure that they're good and dormant, usually around November and you can use those paper wraps to just keep the sunlight from hitting that trunk and then potentially causing that frost crack that we see on the south or west side. Um, so let them harden off, make sure that they have adequate moisture right now, um, but you can wrap them starting around in November. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, our garden is bursting with color and we do have some produce almost ready for harvest. Before we go to break, let's take a minute to see what's happening out in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we are having an insect convention. All sorts of butterflies, pollinators, as well as little legged creatures that are chomping on all sorts of vegetables and fruits and flowers. And that's okay, we're not spraying, we're just kind of letting them feast away. Our Brussels sprouts are getting larger and larger and larger, at least the plants are, and you can just begin to see a little bit of the Brussels themselves forming in the axles of the leaves. This is a vegetable that is best eaten after a light frost, which makes those uh, Brussels sprouts a lot, uh, a lot sweeter, so that becomes something that we will wait and see. We've had some salvia that seeded itself from last year up into some interesting locations in the garden. We also have turf coming up through our erosion control netting and that is down at the end of our rain chain, so that'll be a great thing to be able to watch progress during the fall of the year. 
We need to take a short break. Coming up on our show, we'll have Gladys's plant of the week and the lightning round. There's much more on Backyard Farmer right after these messages. Thanks for staying with us on Backyard Farmer. Later on in the show, we're going to show you some really beautiful hydrangeas, and we'll see Gladys's plant of the week. You can still phone in your questions by dialing 1-800-676-5446, and while you're doing that, we'll start the lightning round. You ready, Elizabeth? I'm ready. All righty. This is right up your alley as a rural girl, which is, can you use catalytic tubs for the garden? And if so, what do you need to do to them? They work really well. You need to make sure that they're washed out, that they didn't have any residual herbicides in there. You need to have drainage holes in the bottom. And to help save on the amount of potting media, you put a bag of mulch in the bottom and then fill the rest with potting media. Sounds like somebody who's done it. Yep, I have two. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would be a good small tree uh, for the Holdridge area, kind of the east side of the house? You can take a look. There are several types of crab apples out there. You could even get by with some of the service berries. Excellent. When should this particular viewer stop picking their rhubarb? How do you know? I, whenever you get tired of rhubarb, and I'd let it get enough energy into its system for the fall. So before too long, I'd quit picking it. All right. Uh, viewer has bleeding hearts in pots. Should they be planted in the ground for the winter? Yeah, they'd probably overwinter a lot better. If not, bring them into the garage where they're protected if you just can't get them into the ground. All right, is it okay to transplant daylilies now? Sure, why not? <laughs> you can't kill them, might as well move <laughs> might them. Might as well move them. <laughs> okay, all right, Amy, you ready? Yes. This has to do with our sample from last week. We have okay. a viewer, who, Omaha viewer, who says they have impatience and the leaves are falling off and just leaving the stems and they don't see anything. Uh, I would probably lean toward botrytis blight in my impatience. There's also a couple other fungal diseases. Um, not a lot you can do at this point in time. All right. Uh, we talked about white stripe and netting on cucumbers already, but what is the kind of the end that turns bright yellow? and then gets rotten on cucumbers? Um, I usually call it like a blossom in rot associated with it. Um, it it's associated with water, calcium, some people do uh, blame it on, but it's just a blossom in rot type situation. You're better off just picking them and throwing them away. All right, uh, is late blight appearing in tomatoes and anything you can do about it? I have not heard of any reports of late blight showing up in tomatoes or potatoes in the area. Uh, there is fungicide programs, but typically we don't recommend using those. Um, just there, there'll be reports if we have any late blight in the area. All right, is there any fall treatment of our pine diseases or is that all done in the spring? That's all done in the spring. All right, thank you very much. You ready, Rock? What toast in the toaster. <laughs> it has to be toasted first. Well, okay. if it's in the toaster, it's done. <laughs> You're gonna argue with that. Do I get a question answered there or not? <laughs> okay, what will kill both wild strawberries and creeping Charlie in the lawn? Um, and he's in most of the 2,4-D products, probably a triclopyr based type product would your best to bet. And once again, they're both perennials. Let's wait a little bit before we spray them. Okay, a viewer in the country has little tiny dandelions coming up all over in their gravel driveway. What, what will kill those and when? In a gravel driveway, I just hit them with the glyphosate. All right. How do you kill water grass in fescue? If they're tuck on yellow nut sedge, uh, there are a number of yellow nut sedge based products out there that they can use. Go to the garden store and figure them out. There's about three. All right. Uh, any way to uh, prevent ragweed next spring? This is a viewer who had it and they want to know what to do this fall to prevent it. Um, if, they, if they're tucking in and around the yard, not really. I mean, that's when you're going to get after the fact. And actually, before you let it head, it pulls relatively easy. All right, uh, when should lawns be fertilized? Are we close? Um, Labor Day weekend. All right, how long do you have to wait to see Roundup wilt in turf? So if you round it up, how long does it take before you uh, see it? Depending on which, that depends on formulation because some of them you can see wilt in as quick as 24 hours because they also have uh, diquat in them and some of them take uh, five to 10 days. So it depends on the formulation. All right, excellent, nice job. 
You ready? Let's go. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> how, do we, how do we keep cicada killers from nesting? As thick a turf as you can get. You could put screens down over the turf. That's not very attractive. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's not much else. All right. Uh, a viewer has found black beetles the size of a quarter near the water. Any idea what those might be? Like a quarter inch or a quarter coin? Quarter coin. Uh, probably either could be a predaceous diving beetle or one of the other diving beetles. All right. Uh, what would be eating rose leaves now? And it doesn't look like Japanese beetle damage. Easily could be rose slugs. Um, bristly rose slug has uh, two to three generations a year here. Okay, and what should they do about it? Uh, they don't do well with uh, strong sprays of water. They can't climb back up on the plant. Uh, you can use a systemic insect killer for them in the rows, uh, you, but if you do use a topical that's not systemic, you're gonna have to make sure you get underneath the leaves. All right, will, will using carbaryl dust on the stems of squash, et cetera, harm the pollinators? If you're using it on the stems, it, they should not come in contact with the pollinators, so this should be fine. All right, excellent, nice job, all. Plant of the week, Elizabeth. Yes, some pretty plants this week. Um, to start off, we'll go with the pretty pink ones just because they're they're popping um, out in that bright color. That's a dahlia. Um, they're a, a bulb, and they're not a hardy bulb, which means every year you have to you know, pull it up, replant it, and start again. Um, wide range of colors on the dahlias, from the pinks to the oranges to the reds to the burgundy. So um, there's pretty much a color uh, dahlia for whatever color you're looking for. Um, you're going to need to make sure that they have adequate moisture, especially if you want them to bloom in the fall. Um, there's a lot of different species and a lot of different cultivars, which means a lot of different colors. So um, just look in your garden center and see if you can find um, some nice uh, bulbs out there are rhizomes and they're really pretty. And then the other one is um, the perilla. This one is a very nice foliage plant. That's why you grow it. It makes those other plants pop because um, it acts as like a, back, a background plant. The thing though is it can be fairly invasive because it can seed itself. The good news is, is you can pull it out fairly easily. Um, so while it does seed itself, it can pull out. Um, it's an annual and um, it's uh, one of the ones that, like I said, makes those other plants start to pop. Excellent. We say thanks to Gladys for sharing the beauty of her garden. And I believe Perilla is edible as well. Salad-like. <laughs> Let's give it a try, Elizabeth. Are the medics standing by? All right, you ready for the next picture, <laughs> Wayne? All right, let's go. Uh, let's see, this is a, a viewer in Trainer, Iowa. And he has 12 uh, Canada red choke cherries. Okay. Um, they've been about six years in the ground, three and a half inches in diameter. Progressive damage with the foliage being eaten. Used to be in late summer and now it's becoming earlier and earlier. He's used both a systemic and a topical and is wondering what else he can do with these. Well, I'll start off with the damage that's kind of the bottom of the leaf there where it's eaten from the outside in. That definitely looks like it could be some caterpillar or grasshopper type damage. However, when you get into those small round circles, that you can see a couple of them on that picture where there's a brown spot that's falling out from that area, which means it's more of an Amy question yeah. than... Mm -hmm. um, Insect question. So, Amy, you want to weigh in it, on this? It is a fungal leaf spot, and we do see them fairly commonly on Canadian red cherry. Um, typically, you're going to do a fungicide application um, early spring um, just to help slow it down. You may have to come in with another application. Uh, you're probably going to be using a copper type uh, fungicide or uh, mancazeb would be probably be the products that you're using. You just need to read the labels to see what is allowed uh, and go from there. But there's a lot of fungal spots that will do that. And as they get older, they'll just fall out and give the leaf a shot hole appearance. All right, so glad he sent that in because it was both insect and disease. And that oftentimes gets confused by viewers. Uh, Rock, this is a, a viewer in Seward and they have a, uh, a yellow weed slash flower that they're saying is taking over their pasture and they want to know what it is and how they can control it. Uh, this is bird's foot trefoil. Um, it's a legume. It's native to one Canadian province in North America um, and actually it's native to Europe and then the UK. 
Um, it's, uh, it, it looks like in that pasture it's, it's taken on a pretty dominant uh, force in that because it can be fairly aggressive. Um, it usually tends to invade pastures that are low on nitrogen because it is a legume. It takes advantage of the fact that it fi fixes its own nitrogen. So some of that may just be, if that's a warm season pasture for, from the looks that it is, a little bit of fertilizer in June or July will pop it up and probably help it recover. Uh, control is possible. Although it is a very, it's a preferred forage for not only, um, you know, barnyard animals, but it also, elk and deer and others like to forage on it, and um, as well as uh, the flowers are really good for pollinators. So you throw that all into the equation. I mean, unless they really feel it's excessive, I guess I would say just leave it, uh, leave it be. And a little side story, when my wife and I were in Dublin, Ireland, they uh, had these really nice lawns all over the Dublin Botanic Gardens, and they use bird's foot trefoil as well as a, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not a Shasta, Kim, but it's a smaller white flower daisy, and then when they mow it, the flower actually physically gets smaller. So three inch mowing height, cool season grasses, primarily the fine fescues, and it's just spectacular. And they don't put any herbicides on it, and of course they get plenty of rain, but it's a really good look. So pasture, you might want to control it. Um, in a lawn, you may want to let nature take its course. Excellent, thank you, Rock, and that was awfully pretty. All right, this is a McCook viewer, Amy. Uh, they have a butterfly bush, looking okay. sickly. So uh, you you might want to weigh in, and then that might go to the other end of the table. Yeah, I think this might be going on the other end. The way the symptoms are showing on, it doesn't really look like a disease issue. Um, if it was a root rot issue, it would be coming from the top, working its way down. Uh, we got some um, intervallian necrosis going on. We could, if it is an insect, and so I'll let Wayne weigh on it, we could be looking at a little bit of nutritional issues, um, maybe a lack of nitrogen or something like that. But I'm going to flip it down to Wayne and let him comment on the insect portion. Just am I, am I, I at a tennis match? <laughs> you are. You're, you're, are you the, are you the net? I'm the net. <laughs> <laughs> I call fault. <laughs> uh, very well could be spider mites. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, a lot of things like that, when it gets to you that bad, um, usually you have quite a few on there. Mm -hmm. um, you can try the, the jet of water through the hose. Uh, that'll wash some of them off, may not take care of everything. But it's one of those things, just because you have them this year doesn't mean you'll have them next year. Right. And uh, this was from down around McCook, right? Mm -hmm. They've missed some of the rains this summer. They're still mm -hmm. hanging on to that drought a little bit more, so they could be very much in dealing with these spider mites yeah. because of that. Yep. So again, for our viewers, uh, make sure you know whether you're dealing with a rot spot or a crawly, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Elizabeth, uh, we have a viewer who, who wasn't quite sure what these trees were. There are. They're arborvita. Uh, she has six in the backyard. Uh, she says they did not get full this summer and they do not look healthy. Uh, wondering what our advice would be on these. Um, one way to tell the arborvita is it's got a very flat, um, frond on it or flat leaf on it. It just doesn't look like a, a pine or, or things like that. Um, they appeared to be planted fairly close to the foundation of the home. And so when they're planted that close, you know, we need to worry about if there's an overhang on the house, are they getting enough moisture? Are they getting enough sunlight? Um, you know, if they don't start to fill out and they're looking fairly bare, there is the probability they might need to be removed. And then if you do decide to replant in that place, you go where you think they need to be and then take another step out away from the foundation. And Kim taught me that one. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to wash those windows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, thanks, Elizabeth. Well, hydrangeas are one of those plants that might bring back some memories of beautiful grandma's gardens. And now, thanks to some breeding, you have many more options to choose from. We recently took our camera out to the strolling gardens in Lincoln to show you a few of the newer hydrangeas. Late summer is really an excellent time to take a look at hydrangeas that you might want to use in your landscape. We have multiple different varieties to choose from and species, and one of the great things that has happened in the past few years is a lot of selection and plant breeding. I want to start by talking about panicle hydrangea, which is actually 100% woody. Behind me is one that is limelight, which has spectacular flowers all over the crowns of the plant. Lots of sterile florets in that kind of that volcano shaped inflorescence at the ends of the branches. With hydrangeas, the more sterile florets you have, the showier the plant is because the fertile flowers are buried down in, inside. 
They're also incredibly fragrant. One of the things about the panicle hydrangeas is they are capable of withstanding a lot of sun and a bit more drought. They also can be actually kept smaller depending on when you prune them. They attract a lot of pollinators and in the plant breeding world, kind of the gold standard used to be one called Tardiva, which had very few sterile florets in comparison to the fertile flowers, but was certainly an improvement on PG. Now we have limelight, now we also have little lime. A second hydrangea that flowers uh, actually a little bit earlier than late summer is smooth hydrangea. And again, that one was Annabelle. Some of the newer selections on that one include Incredible, some of the ones that are pink, those get managed a little bit differently. They're every bit as showy, but once the panicle hydrangeas start flowering like limelight, Annabelle is typically finished, and so those sterile flowers have begun, begun to go to kind of a limey green. It's also a much shorter hydrangea, even though it may not have been managed in such a way to keep it small. A lot of people love the pink and the blue hydrangeas. Those are big leaf hydrangeas. And again, breed, the plant breeding world has come up with methods of actually allowing them to bloom on both current year's wood and previous year's wood. The reason that is important is because if they bloom only on current year's wood and they are not reliably hardy in zones five and four, that means that every single year they go to the ground and there are no flower buds. The difficulty with the big leaf hydrangeas is they do take a lot more care to be able to get those incredible pink and blue flowers. Endless Summer is one of the ones on the market, a newer one called Twist and Shout is spectacular. You do need to be aware that if you really want a reliable hydrangea for late flowering, even mid-season flowering or earlier, you want to go with the panicle hydrangeas as opposed to the big leaf hydrangeas. You know, one of the great benefits of hydrangeas is if you want early or late bloomers, you can get either one and fill that landscape with the versatile plants. And you really do need to know a little bit about what you're after so that you're not tying yourself to either using aluminum sulfate or, or uh, not getting any flowering. So apparently we also have uh, some loyal viewers who are using the lightning round to time themselves as they're working out on their bicycles. So we have a new use for the lightning round. <laughs> 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 All right, you get the next picture, Wayne. Um, this is a Missouri, a Missouri Valley viewer, and they found this, this critter on their outdoor table in his kind of his death throes, and they wonder what it is. <laughs> this is what uh, known as a mole cricket. You can see those front legs. They look about like a mole's front legs, where they, they do use it for digging. They typically burrow. Uh, they're not a pest here, but you get onto the east coast and down south and they can be quite a pest of turf. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had Zach on tonight, I'm sure he'd probably rant and rave about how there are problems in golf courses down there. Mm -hmm. um, but for here, nothing you need to do about them. All right, excellent. And there, there is a northern and a southern, right? There's a northern mole cricket that we have in the And there's, there's a Great Plains too. There's, there's two or three of them. Yeah, but you entomologists name them because they have a different twig or whatever. It's just <laughs> bizarre. But anyway, there is a southern. That's the one that causes all the damage. It's not only Zach that understands it's, golf it's, courses. It's, it's <laughs> better. I, I, I've been on a few. Uh, not that I was offended at all, Wayne, but I'm okay. For now. <laughs> it's and, better and than we, looking at the uh, grass seeds and going, well, let's see here. Which way does the on point? <laughs> and, and the gauntlet is thrown. <laughs> all right, Rock. We have a North Platte viewer who is seeing this sort of damage around the edges of his lawn and several other lawns in North Platte. Uh, is wondering, is it too little water? Is it brown patch? Is it heat from the concrete? Um, it's probably heat from the concrete. I mean, you know, we, I don't think that's bluegrass. That looks like it might be fescue. We might say billbug if it was um, bluegrass, but I am going to say that's just being too close to the heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of some of those hot days. All right, Amy, uh, this is a Strang, Nebraska viewer, and they have a garden, uh, and they're getting some great cucumbers, uh, and then the plants die, and then a cauliflower, and then no cauliflower, and onions, potatoes, et cetera, and some other things did well. Tomatoes, they know they have blossom end rot, uh, but then they all have these other spots and rots and dots on them. So 
What are we All What right. are we thinking here? Well, just so you know, I feel your pain. I haven't been successful in everything in my garden this year either. <laughs> but when you look at the tomatoes, you got two things going on. Those smaller black dots that are raised, that is bacterial spot. Um, it's all superficial. Um, once again, a bacterial disease favored by warm, humid, wet conditions. The other one, you talked about blossom in rot, but you can see on those upper two pictures, there's these holes um, or sunken in areas. That's actually anthracnose, which is a fungal disease. We'll see it move in on the leaves, but it can move in on the fruit too. Um, it's gonna be more prolific with any type of injury locations lo located on that fruit. Um, there isn't a lot you can do at this point in time. You can cut around the spots and still eat the fruit uh, with the bacterial spot. It's all superficial. Uh, so you can peel your tomatoes and be just fine. You can still can them and not have an issue. Um, if you're going to can them and you have the anthracnose, I would make sure you get a good clean area out of there um, just to prevent any possible risk of canning process and, and uh, any of that fungus being viable going into that jar uh, over the winter months. So uh, you can do a fungicide application, a copper type product to help with that anthracnose. Uh, and then copper would also help with that bacterial spot too. All right, thank you, Amy. I just remember my mother's tomatoes blowing up in the basement, so not canning tomatoes. Not canning tomatoes? No. Mm -mm. All right, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a viewer who, uh, a Lincoln viewer, they did pot this tree up from a seedling in, uh, about six, seven, eight years ago. Planted it, nice size, nice shape, and then they've got this going on, and they want to know whether they should even attempt to save it. And, you know, they, they're not sure they know what kind of maple it is. It appears that it looks like it's a silver maple, right. um, probably spread by seed. And once the tree has damage to more than a third of its trunk, that tree is going to have issues taking water up, especially on the side with that wound. And so, you know, long term, that tree is always going to have that damage there. Um, you know, you'll start to see that side of the, the tree starting to fail, whether the leaves are smaller than normal, whether it drops its leaves earlier than normal. Um, if you see some of those symptoms and at that point in time, you know that the tree's not getting the adequate water and nutrients that it needs, um, so removal might be an option. Again, we'll leave it up to the homeowner when they want to remove it, but long-term longevity of that tree is probably not gonna be very good. Right, big maple and weak wooded mm -hmm. too as mm -hmm. well. Well, we have a couple of announcements of things going on in our world, which would be the NET Open House this Saturday, 9 a.m. to noon, right here at NET, behind the scenes tours and more, and that would include us. Some of us will be, will be here uh, greeting our lovely audience and, and uh, showing off a little bit. We're also going to be at the State Fair, August 27th, 1.30 in the afternoon in the new Nebraska building and answering all of our viewer questions. So that's always a fun time. We, we go and eat fried things on a stick and then hope we're actually uh, not comatose. <laughs> all right, uh, Wayne, we had a viewer send us uh, a, uh, an article. This is a Southwest Iowa viewer. Mm -hmm. And there, it's about a new disease being carried by mosquitoes. Do, do we know anything about this yet? Well, I believe they're talking about if I say this correctly, it's chikungunya. It's a, it's a disease that's very closely related, to, if I remember correctly, to dengue fever, which is a big African um, virus that has spread. And then this also, they think, originated from Africa as well. It's transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, it recently made it to the Caribbean. And there are some, a couple cases from southern Florida um, where people have contracted it from mosquitoes here. Um, most of the cases that I've been hearing about through the news media and everything else are from people that have contracted it by going to a place where this virus is already existing and is a problem. So it's not something we should be contracting here. It's not a, established like West Nile virus ha has been for the last 10 years or more. All right, but we'll keep our viewers posted if we hear any more. Yes. All right. Rock, uh, this is a Hastings viewer, wants to know whether uh, when's the best time to power rake a bluegrass lawn? Uh, you want to make sure that you have at least 30 days of recovery after, so sometime around Labor Day, probably into about mid-September, a little bit later than that, and then uh, you get good recovery going into the winter. It also, make sure you don't remove too much too aggressively, because a little bit of thatch is good, uh, uh, too much is bad. Uh, and once again, I'll end it with, we're not real big fans of power raking anymore, unless the thatch is really excessive. We'd rather see you core aerate, 
spring or spring and fall and once you get that uh, thatch under control just use the core aeration because power raking burns a lot of fuel it's really messy you got a lot of debris left over your compost pile is overflowing you're covered with dirt from head to toe and at the end of the day you really haven't done much and if there's thatches there because they're over watering or fertilizing too much just quit doing that <laughs> okay amy we have about 20 seconds okay. this is a cozad viewer with red haven peach uh, and it's splitting by the stem, and then the, the pit is all rotten inside. Any idea what that um, causes that? It could be a combination. It could be uh, brown rot moving in. Uh, brown rot will usually come in in the stem, a fungal disease, and work its way through. Also, the fruit itself turns brown and nasty and soft. So that's what I lean toward. You want to look at a fungicide program on fruit trees on stone fruits for next year. And that's a and that's a, the spring thing. Again, that's a spring right? thing. Yes. Right. So anybody who is seeing those diseases of their lovely edible fruits now needs to be thinking in March. You need to take notes and be prepared for next March and next April. All right. Thanks all. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for Backyard Farmer. We want to say thanks to our panel for another great show and to everybody who submitted questions and pictures. Helping us on the phones tonight, we had Master Gardeners, Gladys Jurink, George Edgar, Cynthia Connor, Kate Gall, and UNL Extension Horticulture Assistant, Terry James. Next time, oh, from Finky Gardens, we had Ryan Lucky. Almost forgot about Ryan. Next time on Backyard Farmer, we'll be focusing on materials for your hardscaped areas around your home. We'll hear about the differences between modern permeable pavers and traditional flagstone. Thanks for watching, good night, good gardening, and we'll see you all next week right here on Backyard Farmer. <laughs>